not what the Lord's laid on my heart for our church for 2024 if the Lord tarries his coming. And uh, I want to just talk to us, though, about vision uh, as a church and preparing our hearts as to be the, um, we had the first Sunday of the, week of the year. We had Brother Caldwell uh, give us a challenge, a wonderful challenge from God's word. And then last week we focused on salvation and the cross and the blood and the morning and evening services. Uh, of course, this morning we've dealt with the subject of making right decisions and uh, how to make those decisions uh, in a God-honoring, Christ-honoring way. And uh, our decisions not only affect us, of course, but they also affect others. What I do affects you, what you do affects me, and uh, we are a body, so it's important that we make uh, right decisions because no man liveth or dieth unto himself. Tonight, this is a message to the church, and we'll get into the Word of God here in just a few minutes. But uh, let me give you the background here. Of course, we love the book of Acts. Um, I was telling someone the other day, I love the book of Acts. It's the the blueprint for the church. If you want to know how a church should be, how a church should conduct itself, uh, you dig the book no further uh, than the book of Acts. It's very interesting. Uh, many of the books in the New Testament, when you take many of the epistles, uh, Paul will introduce it, he'll give a greeting, and then there's an ending, a beginning and an ending, a beginning and an ending. But what's interesting about the book of Acts, it just kind of continues. And, uh, and uh, really, we are all writing the next chapters in the book of Acts because the church continues until the trumpet sounds, and uh, that could be, of course, any day. But we have the true account here in the book of Acts uh, of the early church. And what you have in the book of Acts is, is you have the continuing work. Don't miss this. You have the continuing work of the Lord Jesus Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. You have the continuing work of Jesus Christ in the book of Acts through the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, those who followed him give us a wonderful example uh, to follow in our hearts and in our lives. We know the penman of the book of Acts was Luke, Luke the physician. And uh, he penned, as we will see here in just a minute, uh, Paul's testimony that he gave uh, here, of course, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. When we come to Acts chapter 26, Paul had been arrested uh, for his faith and his stand in the Lord Jesus Christ. He had been taken to a place called Caesarea. And there he had stood before several people. He stood before a man by the name of Felix. He stood before uh, a man by the name of Festus. And then when you come to Acts chapter 26, you now see that he's going to stand before a king whose name is Agrippa. Agrippa II arrives here at, at, at uh, Caesarea with his sister and uh, either Bernice uh, or as Alexander Scorby, who could do no wrong, and I mean that facetiously, <laughs> Uh, he would say Bernice, all right? So however you want to pronounce it, but that's who came with uh, Agrippa, all right? And uh, Agrippa uh, hears about Paul. He had heard about Paul. He had heard about the testimony. He had heard about the uproar that uh, Paul had caused. Again, uh, we said in my men's Sunday school class this morning, everywhere Paul went, there was a stir. There was a stir, amen? Uh, with Paul, it was either pucker or duck, amen? It was either you loved him or you hated him, and there was no middle ground. There was nobody that said about Paul, yeah, he's all right. No, nobody said that. They ever thought he was wonderful. You know, you find people wanting to kill him, and then you have people, when he left, were weeping because he left, right? I mean, there's no middle ground uh, with Paul. And so Agrippa, he had heard about Paul. He had heard about uh, the, the ministry and the life of Paul. And he wanted to hear Paul, and he gives Paul this opportunity. And so here's Felix, and picture in your mind, if you would, this big entourage, uh, all the pomp and circumstance of a king uh, coming into this place. The king is there. These rulers, these dignitaries are there. And Agrippa wants to hear Paul give his testimony. He wants to hear Paul, uh, and he, he allows him. Now, and you got to think about this. There's no freedom of speech here in, in these places. If Agrippa didn't say, Paul, I'm going to give you permission to speak, there would have been no speaking. And we're going to see that Paul recognizes that and uh, thanks Agrippa for saying that, uh, for giving them that opportunity. And what an opportunity he had. And then he, uh, he, he, did, he did well with the opportunity, didn't he? And was ready to give this testimony. And I want to read an extended passage beginning in verse number one, Acts chapter 26, and beginning in verse number one. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art, uh, thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day 
before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was from at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I live a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our 12 tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon I, as I went to Damascus, with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying, in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed forth first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple, and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continued unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none of the things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto all the, unto the light unto the people. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom I also also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. This thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. I'd like to take from my text tonight the 19th verse. Where the Bible says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. For a few moments tonight, I want to preach on this subject, a church obedient to the heavenly vision. A church obedient to the heavenly vision. We need to see that Paul behaved the way that he did because he had a heavenly vision. Paul did what he did because of a heavenly vision. I believe with all my heart that a first century church is what every, first, what every 21st century church should strive to be like. 
I don't mind telling you that without, without any standard stutter, stammer, or apology. That is my goal for New Testament Baptist Church, to be a first century church in the 21st century. We take these characteristics from this church, and we want to apply them to our church in these days. We have so many churches today that are absolutely caught up in the fads of the day, aren't they? But we need to stay with the Bible. We need to stay with the word of God. Listen, it, it, the Bible says it is the word of God that will not return void. We need to be giving uh, the word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. That's the best thing that we can do. I want you to notice here that this early church had the right vision. You see, if you get your vision right, everything else will be right. But if your vision is wrong, everything else will be wrong. Remember Dr. Sexton who... Of course, is now with the Lord, hard to believe. But you remember, he told us that in, uh, us young people at Bible College, he said, he said, guys, he says, uh, your philosophy of life will come out of your theology. Your philosophy will come out of your theology. If you get God right, you'll get everything else right. But if your theology is wrong, your philosophy will be wrong. He was absolutely right about that. Out of our vision comes everything else. If our vision is right, everything else will be right. If our vision is wrong, everything else will be wrong. You see, if we do not have the right vision, you know what we're going to end up doing? We're going to end up doing our own thing. And not what God wants for us to do. We have people not asking today. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about in churches. People aren't asking anymore, is it right? Christians are now asking, does it work? No, friend, get back to the Bible. Get back to the Word of God. That's the wrong question. All right? People want to say, well, will, will it work? Instead of, is this what God wants? If you don't hear anything else I say tonight, I want you to hear this. Everything must begin with God. Everything must begin with God. If you do not begin with God, you're going to end up in the wrong place. Everything must begin with God. May I say this? That the clearer our vision of him becomes, the clearer everything else will become. The clearer our vision of him becomes, the clearer everything else in life will be. Of course, a great example of this, I'd like you to hold your place here in Acts and turn back with me to Acts, the uh, book of Isaiah chapter 6. A great account here, of course, of vision is in Isaiah chapter number 6. Where Isaiah sees the Lord, doesn't he? High and lifted up. By the way, let me tell you that when Isaiah has this vision of God, there was political turmoil there. But yet he had his vision of God. All right, we need to have a vision of God in these days. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 1, it says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I, also, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said, I woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Don't you love this phrase? For mine eyes have seen the king. Amen. The capital K. The Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. He laid it upon my mouth, and so lo, this had touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And said I, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah saw the Lord, didn't he? High and lifted up. You see, our vision of God determines everything we do. You tell me where God is in your life and your vision of God, and I'll tell you that it will determine everything we do. We need a fresh vision of God is what we need. You say, well, I need to do this, and I need to do that, and I need to do this, and I need to help. No, you need to get your vision right. You need to get a vision of God right. And when that is right, then God will direct everything else that he wants for you to do. He will determine the way that we need to accomplish those things. Proverbs chapter 29, the Bible says in verse uh, number 18, where there is no vision, what happens? The people perish. The people perish. Folks, we need to give the gospel. Jesus is the only way. 
Now, that is true. Then why do we have so many churches tonight? We have so many churches that have become nothing more than, than glorified country clubs. Nothing more than social centers. Nothing more than, than, than these things, all right? Listen, if, if, if heaven is true and if hell is true, then we need to be giving out the gospel. This is the work that God has given us to do. And it is so sad that so many churches are about everything except what God wants them to be a part of. And that is preaching the word of God and giving people the gospel. Jesus said this, as my father has sent me, even so, what? Send I you. Send I you. Let me say this about vision. First of all, or some, some introductory thoughts about vision. First of all, vision is a discerning matter, isn't it? It's a discerning matter. May I say this? It is a defining matter. May I say this? It is a refining matter. God is always trying to get the dross out of our lives that we may focus on him. See, we need a fresh vision of the Lord. And, and, and it's amazing. Of course, we just came out of the, uh, the Christmas season. And some people enjoy seeing him as a baby. Why? Because they, they don't feel threatened by that. Mm -hmm. There are a few more, very few, but a few more will see him hanging on the cross. And people, uh, you know, we think that's kind of a cool thing. You know, we're, we're a cross necklace. It's kind of a cool thing to some people. You know what? We need to see him high and holy. Amen. We need to see him high and exalted and lifted up. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Amen. He is high and lifted up. Friend, yes, he came to earth. He was man without cease, uh, God without ceasing to be man and man without ceasing to be God and all those things. He was robed in flesh. He dwelt among us. Yes, he went to a cross. Yes, he bled and died for our sins. He paid a debt he did not owe. And we owed a debt we could not pay. He was buried. He arose. He ascended. He lives today to make intercession for us. But friend, he is exalted on high as the God of the universe today. Amen. We need to see that today. The question for us this evening is this. How great is your God? How great is your God? What kind of vision do you have? Of him. You say, Pastor, how in the world could that church, how in the world could those few people, how in those, how in the world could they do what they did for the Lord Jesus Christ 20 centuries ago? I'll tell you how they did. They had a vision of God. They saw God for who he truly was. Paul here speaks of that in Acts chapter number 26. He said, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. God showed me who he was, Paul said. And when I saw that, I was willing to do what I was willing to do. And I am willing to do what I'm willing to do. And really, he's really saying here, Grippy, you can take my life if you want to. But I'm not backing up. I'm not backing down. I am not folding up. I am keeping on for God because I have a vision of God. I know who God is. I know what he wants to do in my life. And by God's grace, I'm not going to quit. Well, we need that today. We need a fresh glimpse of the Lord. We need a fresh glimpse of him and, 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 and realizing what he wants for us to do. Paul realized his religious endeavors left him lost. And by the way, all religious endeavors will leave people lost. Same with all of us. And we have, but friend, listen, we need to have this vision that this early church had. Now, what will be the characteristics? What will be the characteristics for this church the New Testament Baptist Church. What will be the characteristics of that? What will be the same characteristics that they had? I'm going to give you three things this evening will be done. Characteristics of a church that has the heavenly vision. We have the same vision that the church had. And by the way, we should because God doesn't change. Amen. Amen. He is the Lord and he changes not. So although we are 20 centuries later, our God is still the same. Mm -hmm. We need to see the same thing. Let me give you three thoughts tonight. First of all, I believe a proper vision of God will show us that we are accountable to him. A proper vision of God will show us that we are accountable to him. You see, when we realize who God is, you know what we're going to realize? One day I'm going to stand before him. One day I'm going to give an account of myself. One day whatever he put in my heart and my life to do and to be, I'm going to have to stand before him someday and give an account if I was faithful to that vision of what God gave for me to do. 
It seems like so very few people, the furthest thing from their mind, I mean the absolute furthest thing from their mind, is their personal accountability to God. You think about it. Who thinks about that anymore? Who thinks about standing before the Lord? From again, we need to see God for who He truly is. He is not a small God. He is not an old God. He is not a far God. Hey, listen, He's not your buddy. He's not your pal. He's not your butler who comes at your at your at your beckoning call. He is the Almighty God. Amen. And whom we will bow before. Whom we will give an account of ourselves before. And when we see him as he truly is, when we as, as we enter into his, his presence, it will create in us an accountability. Let me ask you a question tonight. You personally, me personally, as I ask myself this question, what motivates you? What motivates you? What stirs you? What motivates you? Or maybe a better question, who motivates you? What stirs your heart? What, 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 what has caught and captured you? Whose vision are you following? I mean, probably we're all following a vision. Maybe one of our own making. Maybe somebody else is making. I don't know. But whose vision are we following? Folks, listen. We need God's heart in our hearts. Amen? We need his heart in our hearts. We need his passion to be our passion. We need to understand the heart of God and what he wants to do in this world. We should look at people the way the Lord does. Isn't it amazing how we stereotype people? Black, white, rich, poor, male, female, thin, fat, tall, short, whatever, rich, poor, whatever it is. God sees people lost or saved, doesn't he? Heaven or hell. We need to look at people the way the Lord does. And may I say this, that our vision of God should bring us to one great purpose. His. His. You know why we live? For his purpose. You know why you breathe? For his purpose. His purpose in your home. His purpose on your job. His purpose in our community. His purpose in this church. It ought to be his purpose. We ought to have a single purpose. Do we have a single purse, a single purpose? Is there something that you can say? Listen, if I were to ask you, if I were to go down, I wouldn't embarrass you tonight, but if I were to go down every pew tonight and say, what has God put in your heart to do? What has God put in your heart to do? What has God given you to do? Could you say, this is, this is the vision, this is the purpose, this is what God has given me to do. When we see the Lord high and lifted up, when we understand that he has a call on our lives, when we understand that he has changed us, he has forgiven us, he has given us a ministry. Folks, then we have an accountability, don't we? Every day we're going to stand before the Lord and give an account of ourselves. We're going to give an account of what we do this year. Jesus tarries is coming in 2024 at this church. We're all going to give an account of ourselves to the Lord. We hear a lot about vision, especially this time of the year. Folks, it is not vision casting. I'm not trying to vision cast. I'm not trying to share a vision here tonight. It's each of us seeking the Lord. Each of us. It's each of us praying to the Lord. It's each of us desiring to know him. May I say this? And please get a hold of this. Our vision of God is never in contradiction to the word of God. Amen. Amen. Well, you hear it though. God wants me to do this. God wants me to do that. Friend, listen. If it don't line up with this, it ain't his vision. His word and his will never contradict each other. Never. Never contradict each other. You better get in the word of God and make sure that it is a head. Notice he said, he, he, Paul didn't say I was obedient to my vision. He said I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. If it is not line up with the word of God. It is our vision and not his. But because of that vision, because they saw who God is, high and lifted up, folks, that church couldn't be stopped. They couldn't be stopped. They did what no one else could do. May I say their vision was not about things. They were captured by God and his mission. 
You know, the Lord has a mission in this world, doesn't he? God has a mission in this world. And as we get close to him, we will see it and we will understand it. We will know what he wants to do with our lives. You know what my work is? You know what your work is? To do his work. Amen? What is our work? To do his work. To do his work. I want you to turn to a great verse. It's Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And I'd encourage you maybe even to underline these verse, these words and maybe even print this verse out and where you could see it often. What a convicting and challenging verse Mark chapter 3 is that Jesus gives us in his word. Our work is to do his work. And I want you to notice here that our first calling is not to do. Our first calling is to be near him. Notice, these, notice this. This is just so powerful to me, so convicting and challenging to me. In Mark chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible says, speaking of Jesus, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Notice the order there and don't miss that. You be with me and then you go preach. You are with me and then you go preach. Hey, Sunday school teacher, you go with him and then you go teach. You say, I'm a dad. You're with him and then go be a dad. I'm a husband. Good. You go be with him and then be the dad. You see the order there. You see the order there. Our, our first and foremost, our first calling, our first calling is to be with him. How many people get up and just start doing for God without being with God? Right. Many. And by the way, we hear a lot of people talk about burnout. Well, I got burnout. So he got burnout. He got burnout. They had burnout. You know why? I like a lot of that is, is trying to do the work of God in your own strength. No, you be with him. You get, you get with him. You get the, the spiritual nourishment that you need to be with him. And then you go do what God wants you to do. People should see Jesus in us, amen. That we have been, I, I love that testimony. There in the New Testament, that they had that testimony. They had been with Jesus. Folks, they should sense his presence in our lives. Again, I'm gonna say some people have, made service the goal. Service is never the goal. God is always the goal. Amen. And friend, when you make whatever it is the goal and not God, you cheapened it. Now listen, you get with God, guess what you're going to do? You're going to serve. You're going to worship. You're going to witness. You're going to do all those things. All right? But first, it is with him. First, it is with him. Never make a byproduct the goal. Many spend their lives on something that has not come from their vision of God. Now here's the thing. You're spending every day something that you'll never get back. Time. You'll never get it back. You'll never get back 2023. If Jesus tears is coming for another year, we'll never get back this year. Listen, we, once it is spent, it is gone. And so number one, this early church had this vision and a proper vision of God will show that we are accountable to him. Whatever God has given me to do, when I see him, I know that I will bow before him. I know that I will answer to him. I know that I'm accountable to him. Number two, and I want you to go back to Acts 26. Number two, not only does a proper vision of God will show we are accountable to God, number two, a proper vision of God will show action. Look at verse 19. Look at verse 19 of Acts chapter 26. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. Now look at verse 20, the very next verse. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Notice that God told him, hey, listen, you, this is Paul, this is what I want you to do. So he has this heavenly vision in verse number 19 and then verse number 20. What does he do? He goes out and does what God told him to do. Paul, you warn people. Paul, you tell people. Paul, you declare me to those people. And you know what he did in verse number 20? He did Damascus and Jerusalem and Judea and the Gentiles and all the places that Paul went. And we know the journeys that he took and, and place after place, town after town, city after city, country after country, nation after nation, person after person. He began to do the vision that God 
asked for him to do. Paul began to tell others what God showed him. I believe with all my heart, if you're saved, you want other people to be saved as well. Amen. Our work is to do his work and do it wholeheartedly. Our work is to, to get the gospel out. God is our goal, not our task. Our task comes from our desire to please and honor him. You say, all right, preacher, should we be driven? I'm not trying to be driven. I'm, I want to abide in the Lord. I want to seek him. I want to do what he wants. And I want him to put a fire in my bones and in your bones that will motivate us and stir us to do a work for God in these days. It ought to be, listen, it ought not be a, a compulsion from without. It ought to be a compulsion from within. It ought not be from others. It ought to be from God. If I'm not sensitive or if you are not sensitive to those around us that are lost, that that person in front of me is on their way to heaven or hell, if it's, it's not that I need a greater burden for the lost. That's not my greatest problem. You know what my greatest problem is? I've lost my vision of God. Because when I have that vision for God, guess what? His heart's going to be my heart. Guess what his heart is? To seek and save that which is lost, isn't it? Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you to be fishers of men. Again, where does it start? Does it start with fishing for men? No. What does it start with? Following Christ. Being with him. And guess what? When we have that, then, he, then we have his vision. We see people as he sees people, you see. We don't necessarily lose our vision of the lost. We lose our vision of God many times. I need to get my vision clear again. I get, need to see the Lord who he is again. Thirdly and finally this evening, I said number one, a proper vision will show that we are accountable to God. Number two, a proper vision will show action Number three, a proper vision requires faith. Because here's the thing. When you get alone with God and you get a hold of what God wants you to do, and God says, all right, here's what I want you to do, and then that demands action, but it also demands faith, doesn't it? Because here's the thing. Whatever God gives you to do, guess what? It's impossible for you to do. If it's God. If it's God, it's impossible for you to do. So what do you need? You need faith. Faith and action. I believe uh, the statement that many of us have often quoted from William Carey comes to mind here. Yeah. William Carey says, attempt great things for God. That's action. Expect great things from God. That's faith. It's action and faith. It is trusting the Lord. Here's what God, I get alone with the Lord. Here's what God's put in my heart to do. All right, this is it. I realize I'm going to stand before him someday. I'm going to give an account. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do it by faith. I'm going to trust the Lord. I can't do this in my own strength. I can't do it in my own power. I must have faith. I must have God's help to get it done. All right. It, it requires action and faith. It takes faith because we can't do it in our own strength. It takes faith because of opposition. Hey, guess what? When you get, I mean, when you get singular focused on God, I can tell you one thing, a couple of things. First of all, God's going to give you something to do. You're going to get at it and do it. You're going to trust God. Good. All right. You ready for this? Satan's going to come. He ain't going to take it laying down. He is going to fight. You can mark it down. You are going to have opposition. All right. They, did, did they try to fight Paul? Of course they did. Try to kill him. Opposition turns many people away. It turns, turns them back. But again, that ought to be a continual refining process in our hearts and our lives when we go through these things to recognize over and over again that we need the Lord. Over and over again that we need the Lord. It requires faith. And by the way, if it doesn't require faith, then it's not of God. It's not Christian living if it doesn't require faith. And so here is Paul, I mean, he's doing what God wanted him to do. And really, the Christian life is kind of simple, isn't it? You know what the Christian life is? It says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what are you doing in this world? How can I be a part of that? Lord, I want to be a part of what you are doing. And Lord, in all that you are doing... Lord, I want to be a part of that. I, 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 I want to do that. I, I want to be a part of that. And I want to get to doing that. I want action. And Lord, I want to trust you in faith to help me 
get that done. That, that's, folks, that's how the church worked 20 centuries ago. That's how they worked. And again, God is the same God today as he did now. He's the same God today. But this vision demands action. It demands faith. You see, we need to see our weakness and we need to see his strength. We need to see our inability. We need to see his ability. But just keep it simple. I'm his servant. Just, hey, listen, just, <laughs> I'm private first class prior lot reporting for duty today, sir. Amen? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I am your servant. What do you want me to do? All right, here's what I want you to do. All right, it takes action. I need to do it. I need to stay at it with God's help. I need to trust God for every step of the way. <clears throat> Let me give you this little uh, thing here, and we'll be done here in just a moment. And uh, doing a contrast between vision and ambition. And so many people, and it's amazing how many people have taken the world's words and put them into the church. That's another message in and of itself. But listen to this. I believe this will help us tonight. I hope it will help me. Vision begins with God. Ambition begins with man. Vision does a work of faith. Ambition does a work of sight. Vision says, if it's right, God will bless it. Ambition says, if it works, it must be right. Vision is obedient to God. Ambition is in competition with others. Vision desires God to be glorified. Ambition desires the approval of man. Vision is Christ-centered. Ambition is man-centered. Vision serves God. Ambition serves self. Vision lives a life of simplicity and godly sincerity, which is 2 Corinthians 1.12. Ambition is a life of complexity. What do you want to live? A life of ambition or vision? I want to live a life of vision. Amen? Amen. I want you to live a life of vision. I want you to get along with the Lord and say, God, what do you want me to do? God, what are you doing in this world? What are you doing in our church? What are you doing? And Lord, I want to do what you have me to do. Realizing I'm accountable to you. Lord, whatever you give me to do, I'm going to stand before you with that someday. It's going to demand action. Whatever God put on your heart, do. Do it. What vision do you have for, I'm talking to Sunday school teachers tonight, what vision do you have for your class? What vision do you have for whatever God's given you to do? Whatever it is. All right? What is it? All right? God's put you there. You're accountable to him. Get at it. And trust God. God will give you the, the means to do it. He's going to give you the ability to do it. Amen. I'm going to trust the Lord. He said, I can't do that. Amen. You're right. But I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads bowed and our eyes are closed. May God as our church. Give our church. The vision that God would have us to be.